Today, um, we're going to, again, begin with our call to worship from the Lord. And this is our moment to hear from God, from, from his very breath. Hear from him these words from Jesus, our Lord. 
Let's stand in reverence to his word. You're going to hear his calling for us, and you're also going to hear his promise to us in this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Isn't that good news? Isn't that a good reason to come to him and to worship him? Let's do that together today. Hear the call to confession. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has entered the inmost heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with fullest confidence, that we may receive mercy for our failures and grace to help in the hour of need. In the strength of this assurance, let us silently confess our sins to God. Let's, let's sit for this time. Let's sit to confess our sins.
hear the good news, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that in Jesus, God embraces you, forgives you, and strengthens you to live a renewed life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Let's respond to that, singing the good news to one another. Let's stand.
so much good, good truth and promises that we've just testified to in song. Thank you, worship team, for, for leading us in that this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Brandon Smith. I serve as one of the pastors here at Village Church, and I want to welcome all of you uh, to Village Church this morning, whether you are here in person or whether you're joining us online. We are glad that you're here. Uh, we realize that uh, some of you may be joining us. Uh, this is one of your first times here. And if that's the case, um, if you're here on sites, uh, feel free to stop by Guest Central uh, out in the lobby. If, uh, if you're with us online, uh, reach out to us in the church office uh, sometime. Uh, you can uh, get a hold of us through our, our church website, through social media, uh, or, or this thing called the telephone. And uh, whatever you choose, uh, we will uh, be happy to, uh, to follow up with you, to engage with you. Anything we can do to serve you, uh, please let us know because that, that's what we're here for. Um, we are thankful for the ways that the people of Village Church continue to invest in the work of God uh, that takes place, and not just here within the, the building to serve our congregation, but also uh, to uh, extend the work of the Lord beyond the four walls of this church. And for those of you who've been giving faithfully to that, we thank you for that. For those of you on site, just a reminder that we have the offering boxes out in the lobby you can give to. Uh, this morning, for those of you, uh, or really at any point in time, for those of you who are with us online or any of us, uh, you have the opportunity to give electronically uh, through our church's website, through our Realm app. Uh, if you ever have any questions about, uh, about giving here at Village Church, feel free to contact Diane Durkin, our finance, finance coordinator, and she'd be happy to help you with, uh, with anything that may come up. But uh, we're just excited about the ways that God is at work and how he is using the gifts that you give to help advance that work. Uh, excited as well uh, to hear the stories from last week about how God was uh, so good, so faithful at work uh, through our women's retreat, and is hearing a lot of encouraging things coming back from that. Uh, guys, we haven't forgotten about you. We have something coming up for you here in a couple of weeks. Uh, in fact, uh, two weeks from yesterday. Uh, Saturday, uh, May 15th, we have an event uh, for the guys. We're going to do a cookout here. Again, we're just finding that, that people are, are, are just so in need of having personal connection. Uh, as we've been uh, you know, cooped up, isolated in so many different ways here in recent weeks and months. And uh, so we want to provide multiple ways. This is one of those ways specific for the guys. We have hot dogs, brats, uh, you know, chips and drinks, games, activity. It's just a chance for us to get together and connect. So. We encourage you, sign up, uh, contact us in the church office. If you have any questions, uh, you can uh, use the Realm app if you want to just uh, uh, put your name on the list. If you want to bring a friend, uh, that's all right, too. Uh, we look forward to, uh, we hope and trust, to be a good time together at that cookout. Uh, something else that's going to be happening outdoors here at Village Church, that's coming up this Thursday. Uh, the first Thursday of May every year is designated as the National Day of Prayer. It's an opportunity for, uh, for God's people uh, throughout uh, the United States to, uh, to humble themselves, to come before the Lord in prayer, ask God to move and work in, in, in people's lives uh, throughout our country. Uh, we are going to uh, gather together as a church family uh, to do that on Thursday at 7 o'clock, except we are going to gather outside, weather permitting. We're going to gather outside at our fire pit, which is out near the playground. Uh, we hope you can come and join us for that. And if uh, you want to participate in our uh, National Day Prayer Gathering, but you can't join us uh, on site in person, uh, we will have the opportunity to uh, do this through Facebook. Uh, our, uh, we'll live stream it on Facebook. And uh, if you have questions, again, contact us in the church office. But we're looking forward to the time where we can uh, lift up uh, the needs of our, our nation and ask God to move and work in ways that will bring glory to his great name uh, through that. A um, couple words of thanks we want to share with uh, the church family here. First of all, thank you to, first of all, those of you who were here yesterday uh, doing work with our campus uh, work day, our spring work day. Uh, lots of good work done outside, cleaning up, you know, fresh mulch, just some things planted. Uh, we're thankful for those of you who, who gave you your time. Uh, yesterday, and we're thankful as well to those of you who continue to give so faithfully to our congregational care ministry. It's something that we do uh, just like today. Uh, it's the first Sunday of every month, or the Sundays that we, uh, we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and uh, it's an above and beyond way for us to, uh, to give to God's work, uh, to 
bless those in need uh, first and foremost in our church family and I, I'm so pleased to be able to tell all of you this morning that probably within the last month even within the last couple of weeks uh, probably more so than at any point in time this uh, school year this ministry year we have been playing offense we have been, been reaching out we've been engaging with people and finding ways to use the gifts that you have uh, given for this purpose uh, to bless those in need uh, first and foremost in our church family uh, there's also a, a a small wedge of this congregational care fund that is a way for us as a congregation to care for people even outside the walls of village church and we've been able to find ways to do that as well but uh, we're just uh, excited about what God is doing and praying that he's going to keep it coming. And as you all continue to give so generously to this, uh, we're going to see, I believe, many, many more stories written. And uh, we uh, just pray that we will be found faithful uh, to be the best stewards possible of all what God has entrusted to us in this way and in many, many other ways. We're looking forward to continuing our worship here this morning. I was in the 9 o'clock service, and I personally was, was encouraged, challenged uh, by the message that uh, the Pastor David brought from, uh, from God's Word, from uh, 1 John 5, as we're continuing in our series, you know, God, our light and life. And uh, it's with this sense of anticipation and expectation. We want to continue in our worship right now. Pastor David is going to come forward and lead us now in our study of God's Word. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, please do uh, meet me there, 1 John uh, chapter 5. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, verses 1 through 5 today. If you've got an electronic copy on your phone or your computer at home or however, however you're finding way to 1 John 5, I'm uh, speaking and preaching from the English Standard Version uh, today. First uh, John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, read uh, like this. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. And by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Let's pray. Father, we, we come before you with a heart of dependency and trust. We come before you, Lord, knowing that, Lord, every time your word is spoken, you do stuff. You shape our hearts. You, you encourage. You strengthen. You soften. You humble. You sanctify. You call. You create. Uh, so, Father, um, we ask that you would do just that. May the meditations of our hearts, may the words of our mouth, be pleasing to you, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you have certainly probably bumped into from time to time uh, people in your life that you would look at in their Christian life, and the Lord has brought them through seasons and ups and downs, and through it has matured them and grown them and sanctified them, that when you interact with them and when you uh, talk to them, you kind of say inside, man, I, I want to be like them when I grow up. <laughs> Uh, and Sally and I often, when I think about this idea, my wife Sally and I think about an elderly couple we knew from the, the church we were uh, most recently at before Village Church. And this dear couple had been through long seasons of their life of some pretty difficult pain, some pretty difficult suffering, different chapters and experiences of uh, pain that people in their family had gone through that they were caring for. Uh, physical, emotional, spiritual, and they themselves had gone through some pretty challenging seasons. Uh, but when you meet them, when you talk to them, and you all perhaps have names and faces of other people that you think of when we think about this, there was a paradoxical kind of how do these two things fit together kind of idea that they simultaneously 
were kind and humble and gentle and meek and, and soft and tender and at the same time strong, courageous, firm, resolute. And, and every time we'd interact with them, we could sense both and just an, an incredible love and, and softness and compassion for other people. Whenever they interacted with people, you, you got the sense they were, they were handling like a delicate piece of china, so gracious, so compassionate, yet at the same time, you knew at their heart of hearts existed a lion of courage and strength and resolute confidence and power. And I, when I think about them, when Sally and I think about them, we think, I want to be like that when I grow up. Don't you? 1 John 5 shows us how. How do, we, how do we become someone like that? A, a person in their walk with Christ that's both humble and strong, both soft yet firm, both gentle yet confident in Christ. And 1 John 5 opens and shows us that it is grace. How do we become like that? It's grace. It's grace in our hearts that softens us both to God and to each other at the same time. Grace, by its nature, it softens us, it melts us, it tenderizes a hard heart toward God and a hard heart toward others. And it shapes that and frees us up to do just that to God and others. Look at, look at just verse 1, 1 John 5, verse 1. It says that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Messiah, has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. And here we see in 1 John 5, 1, as, and as we see elsewhere in Scripture, and in certainly in the Gospel of John, one of the primary metaphors of salvation itself, of our relationship with God itself, is that of birth, new birth, rebirth, that we are regenerated and born into God's family. And that metaphor, that idea is just oozing and dripping with grace. Think about that metaphor. Uh, which ones of us chose which time we were going to be born into in history? Which ones of us chose which family we would be born into in this life? We see in that metaphor, uh, the child is completely the passive agent in that process. Uh, it, it, it's all of the work of the parent and none of the work of the child. It's, it's oozing and dripping with this idea of, of grace. Listen to what John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 says. God's Word says, But to all who did receive Him, who believe in His name, He, God, gave the right to become children of God who were born, catch this, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, uh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Spiritual birth into God's family is all of His work. It is God who does the regenerative work in our hearts by the Spirit. We've got to respond to it by faith, but the idea of salvation itself and this idea of birth into God's family is just absolutely oozing with God's grace. And if salvation is not something that you and I worked to achieve, but it's something that we have simply received by God's grace, it melts us toward God and it melts us toward others. Friends, if salvation was that we supplied God our spiritual resume with all the good things that we've done and things that we've said and thoughts that we've thought and devotion that we've uh, given to God, if salvation was we present our spiritual resume and God picks, you know, the top applicants, that means then if we earned our position to God, we are entitled to Him and He is obligated to us. Do you see that? Which ones of us um, in your company, in your work, uh, when payday rolls around, when the paycheck comes through, how do you and your fellow employees react? Do you look at your paycheck and burst into tears and joy and wonder, and, did you get one too? Me too! Isn't this it? Are you just bursting with joy and delight? 
No. You know how we act? Should be a little bit more. And should be a little bit more frequent, right? Because <laughs> we're working to achieve it. And we say, well, listen, hey, I got the credentials. I got the training. Look at how much work I'm doing. And this is it. Compare that. I, I forget the name of the TV show. Do you remember that TV show where they'd bring the big, you know, cardboard check with the balloons and they show up to someone's house randomly and they knock on the door and they say, hey, you have won. This is a gift. This is all for you. Do you know how they respond? Tears and joy and they're calling up everyone and they're blown away and they're awestruck. Do you see the difference? One check you work to achieve, one check you receive by utter and sheer grace. And if we are welcomed into God's family by rebirth, by utter and sheer grace and love of God that we receive by faith, it softens our heart to God. We can no longer come to God and say, look at all that I've done for you. Look at all that I've sacrificed. Look at the time. Look at the energy. Look at the tears and the blood and the sweat. You owe me. We can no longer come to God entitled. Nor can we come to God with an attempt to control him with our good behavior, to control him with our effort. We say, hey, God, look at all that I put in for you. Hey, I need you to deliver on this or that request. We stand before him utterly floored by the grace and the beauty of the idea that we have been born into God's family. And we see all, even before we had made that decision of faith, how God had been working to woo us into his family. We come melted before him. And if that is true, it also melts our hearts toward each other. And this is why. That if we stand before God, not is a way of kind of beating ourselves up. If we stand before God, but we declare, I do not deserve you at all. I've done nothing to deserve you. I've done nothing to earn this. It is all of sheer grace. That means when we look to the left and to the right, dear brothers and sisters, you know what that also means? You didn't deserve him either. <laughs> and that's not a way of, of beating up on each other, but it's a way, a reminder that we have all, all of us, have entered this family of faith, this church community, those who are in Christ, you have entered in by sheer and utter faith. And that melts our heart towards each other. Because again, if this was a spiritual application that God only tip picks the top applicants, that means you and I are spiritual competitors competing for a position in God's family. But that's not the case at all, is it? We're companions fellow recipients of grace and mercy and kindness, that when we come before God and we look to our left and to our right and we behold the family of God, we're melted. You too? He, you also born into his family? You've received his grace as well? And it melts our hearts towards others. It frees us with the capacity to interact with each other as friends, as family, as fellow loved ones, loved by God. And this love that God has, it, it kills amongst the Christian community any idea of either superiority or inferiority. The very idea of a superior or inferior Christian amongst the community of faith makes no sense whatsoever. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work. And when those ideas creep into our heart, either entitlement to God, control over God, or superior or inferiority amongst each other, grace flattens it. Grace kills it. Grace destroys it. Because, as others have said many times, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is flat. We're all fellow recipients of his grace and kindness towards us, which that grace frees us, frees us to love God and to love others. It produces the result that verse 2 and 3 shows. When it says in verse 2, 1 John 5, by this we know that we love the children of God. When it says the word this is pointing backward to the first verse. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of him. Everyone who loves the Father loves whoever ever has been born of him. By this, this new birth, we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love, uh, uh, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, 
and His commandments are not burdensome. And here we see, uh, once again, this idea that a love of God and a love of others mutually authenticate each other. They mutually inform each other. They're inseparable from each other. And all throughout 1 John, the letter of 1 John is um, spirals, not in redundancy, but in depth. We've seen this concept over and over throughout this letter of 1 John. If we love God, we must love others. And because of His grace, this passage shows us, we are free to love God and others. And this idea just continues in 1 John to, to steep and to age well, that we see the depth of the implications of how this sense of a love of God and love others authenticate and inform each other and encourage one another and drive the other deeper into the other. A love of God with which he has first loved us. And here's, here's an irony. You might have saw in verse 3 when it said, for this is the love of God. Ever wondered, how do I love God? Here it is. We keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. And to our hearts, that makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> you might have noticed in the call to worship, the passage, Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Remember how it, that passage continues? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. And we think, wait a second, Lord. If you're offering rest, why am I getting a yoke? That sounds hard, that sounds heavy, that sounds burdensome. How in the world do you say in the same breath that keeping God's commandments, His instruction, His teaching, His guidance for us in Scripture, keeping His commandments is not burdensome? And ironically, when we keep God's commandments, we are most free. We, we flourish most. It's the opposite of what we would expect. Now, grace absolutely frees us from a lot of stuff. It frees us from death. It frees us, believers, from the condemnation of sin. It frees us from the hold and the grasp of the power of Satan. It frees us out of the kingdom of darkness and puts us into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Grace frees the Christian from a whole bunch of stuff, and that is biblical, and that is good and true, and good news for you and I. But also notice, grace frees us for. Grace frees us for God, and grace frees us for others. And this is often, uh, it doesn't quite make sense to our minds. How does grace free us for something? Well, John Stott, an Anglican minister and theologian, writes in the contemporary Christian, Christian, listen to what John Stott says. Some of you know this name very well. He writes, True love places constraints on the lover, for love is essentially self-giving. And this brings us to a startling Christian paradox. True freedom is freedom to be my true self as God has made me to meant me to be. And God made me for loving, but loving is giving, self-giving. Therefore, in order to be myself, I have to deny myself and give myself. In order to be free, I have to serve. In order to live, I have to die to my own self-centeredness. In order to find myself, I have to lose myself in loving. Stott continues and says, true freedom is then the exact opposite of what many people think. It's not being free from responsibility to God and others so I can live for myself. That is bondage to my own self-centeredness. Instead, true freedom is freedom from my silly little self. You've got to read that part with a British accent for it to really, you know. True freedom is freedom from my silly little self so I can live responsibly in love for God and others. Do you see the irony? Do you see the paradox? But do you see how much this rings true, that this idea that we are freed from death, sin, etc., etc., but we are free for God and for others? And do you want to know there's three different groups, certainly more, but three, at least three different groups that get this intuitively. Professional athletes, professional artists, and anyone who's been married 
two decades and above. <laughs> why, why do the professionals just make it look so easy, so smooth? You know, why is it when you see, you know, Tiger teeing up, it just looks so smooth. I get my swings worth when I go golfing. Left, right, woods, all over the place. They make it look so smooth. Same thing with artists, right? Whether it's, it's music or whether it's a painting. You see a professional artist do, and, and then have you ever tried it? Then you and I try it. We try a painting. It looks like a you know, kindergarten piece, you know, that we've constructed together. Why, does, why, why, do, why do they make it look so easy? Thousands and thousands of hours of the right constraints. They've submitted themselves to hundreds and hundreds of hours and thousands of hours of submitting themselves to the right kind of constraints and restrictions and commands and do's and don'ts. And ironically, the more they are constrained, right, professional athletes, the, agonize over what they eat. Professional artists, there's no such thing as just one shade of yellow, right? Thousands of shades of yellow. And you might say, well, how do, how do married couples fit into this? Remember I said two decades and above? You know this well, don't you? You've been married for 10 or 12 minutes. Your marriage will flourish the more that you die to self and serve the other. Ironically, the more of the good and right and God-designed and God-created constraints and commandments you willingly submit yourself to, the greater experience of flourishing you will experience. That's how when you read through the Psalms, you're going to run onto verses that say, I delight in your law, O Lord, that the law uh, encourages us and replenishes our souls. How is that possible? Because we are designed as God has designed us to be. And when we live under his design and submit to his commands, his desires, his will, his restraints that he gives us, we flourish, we grow. Is a lake trout 30 feet under Lake Michigan more free 30 feet above the lake? Is a seagull more free 30 feet in the air or 30 feet under the water? Is a train more free on or off its tracks? Dear Christian, are you and I more free in or outside of God's will? And in a very uh, terribly ironic way, sin, sin always paints itself as the freer option. Sin says, you want true freedom? Come. Come. Come run to the green rolling pastures of true freedom. This is what sin says. And it says, come, come. And the more we walk into brokenness and sin, the more bondage, the more uh, life draining, the more broken we will be. When sin says, come and live, you know what it's really saying? Come and die. Come die with me. That's what sin says to us. And in a very ironic and beautiful way, the more we say no to sin and yes to righteousness, the more we willingly submit ourselves to God's commandments and teaching, instruction, and design, the more free you and I truly are. And my friends, if a train truly is more free on its tracks, then grace itself New birth is God himself picking us and putting us on those tracks. He's the one that welcomes us in by sheer and utter grace, and it melts us. We're no longer trying to earn his approval. We're no longer trying to entitle ourselves to him. We're no longer trying to control God. We just obey him because we love him, because it's a response to grace. We're no longer competing with each other. We're no longer looking to the left and to the right or either, either with our chins uh, down in inferiority or, or looking down our nose in superiority. Uh, we're equally melted by grace. And as we walk in his commands and as we walk in his designs, we are free, truly free, truly free from sin and death and Satan and, tr and truly free for God to obey his commands, and for one another. 
And friends, that's, that's the part. Remember, we, we started out by asking, how do we become a kind of people, a kind of community, a kind of person that's soft and tender and humble and meek toward others? Grace. Grace gets us there. Grace melts our heart to that place. But that's not all. That's not all. Grace not only softens us, it strengthens us. Grace not only makes us humble, it makes us courageous. Grace softens us toward God and others, but then grace gives us courage, confidence to face the world. Gives us a courage and a hope and a, and a resolute ability to stand strong and face the world, to face brokenness, to face evil, to face all that is out there. Grace is what gives us that courage to face that. Look at what it says in these next verses, verses 4 and 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And catch this. Three times in these two verses, the word overcome comes up. Once, this idea of victory. God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who it is that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And this word is both humbling and encouraging to us. Because, my friends, if the world needs to be overcome, the world, and remember, in the Gospel of John and in the letters of John, when you hear the word world, don't think of humanity at its best. Think of humanity at its worst. Don't think of humanity holding hands, singing kumbaya together in unity. Think of fists clenched, shaking against God. The world, every time you go through the Gospel of John and every time you look at the world in, in this letter, you're going to see humanity that has rebelled against God. You're going to see humanity that hated our Savior. You're going to see darkness that willingly rejected the light. You're going to see humanity that crucified Him and spat upon Him. This is, this is our default position of the human heart, enemies of God. And if... if if the world, the realm of sin and evil, the dominion in which Satan resides and has control over, if that's the world and it needs to be overcome, that humbles us. Because if, dear brother and sister, if, dear Christian, if you try to out the author of light, do you know what you're going to look like to the enemy? A chihuahua. No bite to back have. We're going to look like chihuahuas. Now, I'm sure some of you probably have a chihuahua. This is not a commentary against chihuahuas. <laughs> but but we're, to the enemy, we're going to look like this, you know, courageous fighter and about seven ounces heavy. It's not going to work. And it makes us, it humbles us, right? It, 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 it evaporates any kind of naivete of the brokenness of our world and the sober, humbling effect that we need someone to overcome a, a spiritual force that's too strong for us, too strong for you, too strong for me. We need a Savior. Yet at the same time, don't miss this, yet at the same time, if we have the author of light at our side, if we have the King of Kings, if we have the Lord of Lords, the God of Heaven's armies, and we don't storm the gates of hell, but we, we sit back in fear, then do you know what we're going to look like? Turtles and Eeyore with kind of our head back in our shell, oh, don't send me in, kind of discouraged Eeyore version of Christian. God will have the victory. Are you, I don't know, are you sure? Maybe not. But he says the gates of hell won't prevail. Well, we better check. Maybe his grace ran out. Do you see how foolish that looks as well? Dear Christian, if God is for you, who can be against you? If the God of the universe who speaks and stars come into existence, if the God of the universe that tells the ocean, this is your boundary and no further, this is where water will stop and land will start. If the God of the universe who sets planets in orbit, who regenerated you and me, 
The God of the universe who is all-powerful, almighty, infinitely wise, infinitely gracious, infinitely good. If he is by your side, dear Christian, why cower in fear? Why discouraged? Why, when you look out in the brokenness in the world, do we forget that, yes, there will be battles won and lost for good and evil, but do not forget the end result. He has won, and it's only a matter of time until he returns again. Why discouraged? Why have you lost heart? Why cower in fear as we stand fellow Christian soldiers in a spiritual battle with the God of the universe himself as our commander, that when he says charge, you have a confidence that's bigger than yourself. You have a confidence in the God who is with you. You have a confidence that he will never leave you or forsake you. And that his power becomes yours by faith in him. Do you see how beautiful this is? We have a hope not because you and I are so strong, but because he is so strong. And he's with us. And if the world has to be overcome, it sobers us, it humbles us. This is a real war. We can't be naive. Yet at the same time, if he has overcome the world, never lose heart. Never lose your cool. <laughs> never lose confidence. Because you have been faith born into Jesus who has already won the victory. That's what it means when it says, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. The idea isn't that we're so sincere that God finally sees our sincerity and we have victory. The idea is we've put our faith in Christ who has had victory and his victory becomes your victory. Listen to what it says. Uh, John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And dear Christian, by faith you are in the Savior, you are in the Lord who has had ultimate victory over the forces of darkness. And that, my friend, is reason for confidence. That, my friend, is reason for courage. It both sobers us, sobers us up so we're not naive, and it strengthens us profoundly to face all that the world may bring. One of the things that um, Sally and I have reflected on, uh, many of you know very well, it wasn't that long ago that I was candidating for the position to which now I uh, fill. And as Sally and I were getting to know Village's story and, and getting to know more about Village Church, one of the things we loved and continue to love is that Village Church is a multi-generational church. I love that. There's something good and beautiful and right about, about little ones zooming around, bumping into your knees. And about those who have walked with the Lord and walked through life for decades and decades and decades. And dear multi-generational family, we help each other. We encourage each other. We sharpen each other. We remind each other of truth. And we grow and we are better for it. And those of you, and I'm, I'm going to let you decide what category you fall in. Uh, those of you who would land amongst the older generations, just by the nature of how many years you have lived, you've had more time to observe spiritual decay in the world firsthand. You've had more time to see how pervasive sin can be, how destructive sin can be, how destructive evil can be. And there is a, there is a possibility and a temptation, the more that evil is before us, the more battles that you have seen won for the evil one, the greater possibility and the greater danger for either, either cynicism or, or defeatism or a lack of confidence because it's going to be harder and harder and harder to hear things like God is victorious, He is one, we have victory in Him, and you say, I've seen a lot in my life. And I've seen many battles won for darkness. It can be easy to get sucked into this I, uh, the idea of that... Has, has darkness really won? Will God truly have the victory? It can be easy to get sucked into that. Those of you who are amongst the younger generations, again, notice how I'm letting you categorize yourself. There is a danger there as well. There, there is an idea that uh, 
your zeal, your energy, not God's zeal, not God's energy, your ideas, not God's ideas, your resources, not God's resources, are what's going to be able to save the world. And, and, and if we're not careful, there can be a naivete that creeps into that. Let's storm the gates, which can be a challenge for some younger generations, the older generations, well, we've been trying it for decades. Go ahead. See how easy it is. <laughs> and there can be kind of a naive approach for that. But don't miss this, dear brothers and sisters, Village Church. We see each other's blind spots, and we help each other out in that, don't we? We encourage each other. We help apply biblical truth um, across and amongst multi-generations to carry on through this battle, through this spiritual war that God has put us on. Many of you know that um, I grew up most of my, well, all my childhood was in uh, northern Minnesota, up where the polar bears realm. <laughs> Just kidding, we don't have polar bears, but it's pretty close. <laughs> And uh, you could always spot uh, someone if it was their first time walking out on a frozen lake in the middle of the winter. You want to know what they look like? And then they would, kind of, you know, just, okay, just real slowly. And then, you know, before you know it, they're on all fours. And before you know it, they're like, you know, flat on their stomachs on the ice, hoping for safety. What if I fall through this ice? And while they're laying on the ice, you know, the local teenagers who borrowed their dad's F-150 are, you know, at 30 miles an hour doing donuts, spinning around on the ice. <laughs> is, it, is it wrong to be fearful, appropriately so, of the icy cold waters of a broken world underneath that ice? You've got to respect the cold. No. It's not wrong to have an appropriate fear that if I go through this ice, there is a broken world. There are forces of evil and darkness in this world that will harm me. Hence, walking like this when it's your first time on the ice. But dear Christian, when you stand on Christ, you are standing on thick ice. Is it wrong to have a sober appreciation for that the brokenness in this world is harmful and dangerous? No, it's not wrong to think that. But dear Christian, know on the one of whom you stand on. Know the foundation that you have in Christ, that when you stand on him, you can stand. You can run. You can walk because he is a sure foundation. Some of you might remember the old hymn, Standing on the Promises of God. Some of you might remember that one. Do you know what the title is not? Creeping on the Promises of God. <laughs> Creeping on the Promises, I just might fall. That's not how the song goes. <laughs> Worrying every moment where the Spirit call. Doubting in my, here comes the ER. Doubting in my Savior as my all in all. No, Creeping on the Promises. That's not what it says. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Trusting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Dear fellow Christians, you stand on thick ice. God has given you promises strong enough, thick enough, deep enough that you could drive a car out on that thing. That as as we look at a world that is desperately in need of Christ, as we look at a broken world, as your children and grandchildren navigate a broken world, you can have a sure foundation that gives you confidence, that gives you courage, that gives you hope and a resolute, firm faith. That as you march out, dear Christian soldiers, for the spiritual battle that's before us, we can march out with confidence. We can march out knowing that he is with us in such a way that both sides of that ditch are avoided. We don't run out naive as if we've got all the resources. God has the resources. But we don't run out fearful. We don't run out in cowardice. We don't run out wondering, will the forces of good or evil win? You know the answer, dear Christian. Remember it. 
And that's what produces in our heart this paradoxical sense, meekness, kindness, gentleness, humility, patience, mercy, grace, and confidence, courage, a fearlessness, a lion of a heart that is not produced because you and I are so courageous or strong, but because he is so good and so powerful. Grace, my friends, grace melts our heart toward God and others. It frees us to love him and love others. And it gives us courage to face the world. Let's pray. Father, we, we ask that you would remind us every single day that the battle is yours. And Father, I pray for all who can hear my voice Lord, those who are discouraged and fearful, may you give them a sense of confidence and hope. Lord, those who are weak, may you give them strength. Those, Lord, that need a fresh reminder that this is a battle, would you graciously remind them of that? And over and over and over, Lord, as we go out into this world every single day, May we go out as a people that have been shaped by you, kind and strong, meek, yet with courage, that your strength might be evident through us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. In a moment, we're going to sit together and eat at the Lord's table. But before that, we're going to sing this truth for those of us who put our trust in Jesus. This is so true when we sing, No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. So let's stand, let's sing these truths together in remembrance of Jesus. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is only jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine i can sing all is mine yet not i but through christ in me But I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior, He will stay I labor on In weakness and rejoicing For in my need His power is to To this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the
John chapter 16, verse 33. Hear it again. Hear it afresh. In the world, you will have tribulation. You will. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And communion is a reminder that he has overcome. That death has been defeated by death. That sin has been undone because our Savior absorbed it into himself and did away with it on the cross. That death has been defanged and that we can have hope. Communion reminds us of this victory every single month. And you might, perhaps you might wonder, well, why do we do communion so much? Why does God call us to remember this? Why does God bake this in to the rhythm of Christians for centuries as a consistent reminder? One of the reasons he tells us to do it often and when we do this to remember what he has done is because we forget. We can forget. It is a very real experience that you and I have had that we can scroll ourselves into a place of discouragement. We can scroll long enough that we can start to wonder, will God truly win? Will light win the day? Is Christ's return going to be a triumphant one? Communion says yes, 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 and yes. He will win, and he has. He has won. And he's won through his own undoing. Victory through death. <laughs> a win through his defeat, that faith born into him, you and I have hope. 
So as we participate together, remember what he has done for you. May it melt you and encourage you. As we peel back this first layer, and as we see this small wafer, really, this small representation, this small symbol of what has truly taken place in the gospel, that Christ's body was broken, nailed, pierced, bruised, buried in the tomb, but didn't stay there. This reminds us of how far God would go to make good on the promise that he would have victory through Jesus Christ. So as we remember this, as we participate together, as you hear this word, these words, may you have hope that Jesus said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we peel back this second layer, we see the cup, we see the drink, we see that which is representative and that which reminds us and points to the real and true thing of Jesus Christ whose blood was shed for us. This guarantee of this new covenant, remember those words again in light of what we heard of today in John. If he has overcome the world, do you want to know how far he would go to guarantee that? He would write the promise. He would write the covenant in his own blood. This cup is a new covenant, Jesus says, in my blood. That's certainty. That's confidence. That's thick ice, dear friends, that you and I walk on. And see how far he's gone to make good on that victory and to give you that courage and hope. So hear these words again, afresh, anew, as we remember what he has done. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So dear brother and sister in the faith, we ask as we sing now this song of response, would you stand and would you stand with a sense of humility and hope, weakness and strength, softness and courage because of him. We're going to sing our story right now, sing the story of how Jesus, how we were like sheep, had gone astray, and, and um, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all.
been said by another, but it's too good not to say again that when we see that Jesus is all we have, we realize that he's all we've ever needed. And we have this hope and confidence because of what he's done for us. And we want to encourage you, as, as is our custom, every single first Sunday of the month, we, we participate in communion together, this reminder for each other. But we also collect our congregational care for our congregational care fund. And just to echo what Brandon, Pastor Brandon, had already shared earlier, be encouraged. You guys have been so generous in a tough season. You're helping each other. You're blessing each other. You're bearing each other's burdens. So we ha please do pray about this. To whatever extent you can contribute to that, please do. And to whatever extent you have a need or someone that you know has a need, seek us out. Let us be a conduit of blessing from God through us to you, to those who have a need. And also we encourage, continue to pray with and for each other. Lean into one another, your families, your spouse, your small group, your ministries, to go through this season prayerfully and carefully with confidence in him. And now, village, receive this benediction, receive these words to send us out into our week with both confidence and hope. May to our, to our God who is merciful and strong, to our God who is compassionate and mighty, to our God who is love and just, who bears us up when we need help and strength, who extends mercy when we need forgiveness, and who will see us through till on that final day when there is no more pain, no more tears, no more crying, we will stand in glory with the saints who have gone before in all the heavenly realm singing hallelujah. To him be all glory and all praise. Amen. Amen. Please do turn, greet one another, say hello, and greet each other as you head out today.